to logistical notes first. We have two speakers, Professor Gonzalo Lizzerade from the University of Montreal and Professor Ilan Kelman from University College London, England. Each has 30 minutes. We then have two panelists, both from York University, Professor Anna Zalik and David Atkin. Each has 10 minutes. At 11.30, we should be able to open the floor to questions, comments, reactions, suggestions. And we have 25 minutes for the Q&A segment. To manage interventions effectively and fairly, given the size of the audience, I ask that you use the raise hand Zoom feature if you want to, to speak. And now let me introduce our first speaker, Gonzalo Rizzaralde, a professor at, 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 a professor at the School of Architecture at the University of Montreal. He has taught at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, McGill University, Canada, the International University of Catalonia in Spain, Universidad del Valle and Universidad Javeriana in Colombia. Professor Lizarade is the holder of the research chair Fayol McGill Construction in Architecture, Construction and Sustainability. He is also the director of the IF Research Group and the leader of the Disaster Resilience and Sustainable Reconstruction Research Alliance. He is a founding member of IREC, an international network of specialists in disaster risk reduction and reconstruction. He is the author of the books Unnatural Disasters and The Immisable Houses, and the co author of the book Rebuilding After Disasters. He is a member of the College of New Scholars, Artists, and Scientists of the Royal Society of Canada, the country's first system of multidisciplinary recognition for intellectual leadership. Professor Lizarade, the floor is all yours. Thank, Thank you. you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I want to. Thank uh, Ali and all his team at York University and CFL York for organizing this and for inviting me to this very important event. Uh, the title of my presentation is pretty much the title of uh, my book, Why Most Re Responses to Risk and Climate Change Fail, But Some Succeed. And in order to explain this argument, I'm going to use the plastic straw fallacy or what I would call the plastic straw sophism. Basically this idea that we can uh, ban, for example, plastic straws or plastic bags in stores. And, and, and with, by doing that, we really don't have to make tough choices. We can basically get around easily with the type of problems and risk creation we are facing today. But at the same time that we're banning plastic straws or plastic bags in our stores, at the same time, we haven't changed our patterns of consumption and we haven't changed our ways of living. For example, in Canada, the US and Australia, for the past 30 years, the size of houses has increased about 30%. Uh, that also happens in terms of not only bigger homes, but also cooler homes. The size of families are shrinking in these countries, but we have we're building larger homes and more air conditioned ones. Uh, there has been an increase of about 20% of air conditioned homes in the past 20 years in the US alone. And that also is applying to cars. We're building, we're producing more electric cars, but we're also building larger cars. The percentage of the size of the market of SUVs in the US and Europe has increased by about 14%. So we're building perhaps more electric cars, but also larger ones. And in the past 16 years, we have produced about 3.1 billion tons of plastic. So this seems to be kind of a contradiction. At one, on the one hand, we're kind of banning these plastic straws, but at the same time, we're not really modifying our ways of living or patterns or behaviors. If we see what's going on in literature, well, we see that we're kind of buying this idea of sustainable development. Look, for example, the use of some terms in, in, a, in, in a scholarship work in, in, in academia, the use of disasters has increased. Climate change, of course, is a very important term now used in academia, but way more important than those two terms have become sustainability. So as, as academics, we're kind of buying this idea that sustainability is the way forward. It's, uh, it's a term way more popular than, for example, artificial intelligence or black holes, which are very popular terms, I think, part, in part due to pop culture. Between 1987, when sustainable development was elevated to the 
level of international policy to 2008, we have increased CO2 emissions by 1.7 times. Global temperature have increased, has increased by 0.4 Celsius. Sea level rose by 80 millimeters. We have killed uh, large amounts of wild species by about 60% of reductions in populations. We have lost about 2.5 million square kilometers of Arctic ice, sea ice, and we have lost great percentage of shallow water corals and oceanic oxygen reserves. And as you probably know, disasters have also increased since the 1980s to today. So what's going on here? We could say that the principles of sustainability, but that also applies to resilience, and as you will see in my book, to community participation and innovation, have not been sufficiently adopted. We can say, we could say they are misunderstood, perhaps poorly implemented. But what I'm arguing in this book is that something else is happening. They are part of the problem. And the argument of the book is to say, well, not only these are part of the problem, but I'm trying to reveal how and what are the consequences of that. So let me give you today a few examples. The first example is this idea of the blank slate. When disasters happen, there is this need to build new green solutions, resilient urban solutions to solve the problems that we were facing. This was certainly the case in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake that destroyed Port-au-Prince. You can see here an image of this uh, charcoal market in downtown Port-au-Prince. And there was this idea at the moment after 2010 that there, there was this need to remove all these uh, sectors and slums in downtown Port-au-Prince and replace them with what? Well, replace them with sustainable, green, resilient solutions. New buildings, we were going to eradicate all this and build sustainable buildings that will bring Haiti to modernity. Well, at the end, we know that didn't happen despite the enthusiasm and efforts of some international agencies that never really materialized. What happened in ten, instead was Canaan. Canaan was an empty zone in the northern part of Port-au-Prince, basically a place that was not inhabited, uh, that was basically agricultural land. And after the disaster, people started to go and settle in Canaan. It started with just 60 families, and today we calculate that there are more than 300,000 300, people living in informal conditions and precarious conditions in Canaan. And producing green solutions wouldn't be that bad if they didn't have skeletons in the closet, but they often do. This is a case, for example, of Echo Park, which was sold a few years ago as one of the greenest developments, urban developments in the outskirts of Hanoi in Vietnam. This was supposed to be one of the most sustainable new developments in the periphery of Hanoi, full of green, resilient, innovative solutions to overcome some of the problems of Hanoi today. But unfortunately, this was built mostly on rural land, and that implied that close to 3,000 families had to be displaced in order to build Echo Park. And many of them were forcibly and aggressively displaced from their lands. Another issue I tackle in this book is the idea of aid. How much does aid actually aid? What are the relationships that we're finding today in the field of reconstruction or risk reduction? And by analyzing this, we will, I reveal in the book that many of those northern, southern relationships are still very strong, but there is also lots of aid happening today south-south, and new countries are entering this aid arena, such as China, for example. You can see here an image of a tent that was donated by China for the reconstruction in Haiti. So this is kind of challenging the way we see aid today with advantages and disadvantages. One of the best, most successful examples of reconstruction in Haiti actually came from a Colombian NGO that understood many of the problems of working in the global south, something that many international and, and northern organizations didn't understand. Another idea is this, is this principle of innovation. After disasters, or in order to prevent disasters, we need to innovate. We need to change construction practices. We need to change behaviors. We need to change ways of living. And this was certainly the case again in Haiti. After the earthquake in Haiti, 
the Building Back Better Foundation by the, sorry, the, the Clinton Foundation started the Building Back Better program of reconstruction in Haiti. And the idea here was to call for the most innovative construction and architecture and design companies to build the types of houses that were going to solve the problem. This is one of the examples of houses that were attempted by architects and, and, and urban planners and builders in after the disaster, many of them using recycled materials and new technologies. Of course, Asians didn't want to live in this way. It didn't resonate with their traditional ways of living. They didn't want to move to the place Soranje where this exhibition was built. It was a total disaster. Here, another example of innovation that was promoted after the earthquake in Haiti. Nobody wanted to live in these type of houses. This was a big failure and eventually the building back better program of the Clinton Foundation failed. And again, we have this idea that resilience is gonna fix the problem. If we adapt, if we uh, build more resilient systems, we're gonna get away with it. And this is certainly the case, not only in the global North, but also in the global South. We, can, we know that many cities, including Cali in Colombia, are now part of the resilient cities program of the Rockefeller Foundation, for example. There is this idea that by adopting this, this language and this resilience policy, we're gonna get around the problem. And actually some of those ideas get written in policy, but they do not fully translate into practice. This is a town that is just besides Cali in Colombia. Cali, again, a resilient city by the Rockefeller Foundation program. And this is Jumbo. Jumbo is in the outskirts of, city, of the city of Cali and Jumbo is an industrial city. And many uh, rural migrants coming to, to Jumbo are looking for jobs because there are many companies uh, already operating in Jumbo. But what they find actually, it's lots of pollution and they have to um, build in informal settlements. And this is one of the neighborhoods built uh, by, by people in the outskirts of, of, of Jumbo. Well, so it seems that there is a contradiction between what we write in policy, what we attempt to do, and what is going on on the ground. So basically what I've been trying to do for the past few years is listening to people and what their stories are, what they're telling us about, and trying to contrast this with the official rhetoric and arguments and policy that we are preparing. And here is an example, this guy, in, this man in, 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 in Cuba, in a coastal fishing community in Cuba, talking about climate change said, the ocean has never harmed me, only people have. And these are the type of narratives and, and, and ideas I am interested in and I'm trying to reveal in this book. So we have on one hand, the official and academic narratives and on the other hand, we're finding these local narratives about risk and climate change. For example, in the official and academic narrative, narrative, we see climate change as an atmospheric crisis, whereas people on the ground are telling us, well, this is more of a social and environmental crisis. Whereas the uh, institutions and academia, we're talking about resilience, people on the ground are talking about absence of the state, environmental and social injustices going on. Whereas some policy documents and official documents focus on natural hazards. On the other hand, people are talking about crime and machismo and corruption and lack of water and services and food. On the one hand, this idea of adapting, and on the other hand, this idea of finding opportunities, people looking for opportunities for jobs, for education, for uh, income generation. On the one hand, this idea that people should develop adaptive capacities. And on the other hand, people talking about attitudes and, and activism, long-term threats, and people talking about daily struggles. I don't have food for tomorrow, for example. Sustainable development is a paradigm to, for fixing this, uh, these problems. And on the other hand, people talking about aspirations and social status. Responsibility transfer, notably through neoliberal policy that transfer responsibilities to markets and to the private sector, and the idea of need of protection from communities. This idea of relocation, whereas on the other hand, people are calling for continuity. And we tend to forget the invisible sector too. We tend to forget that this sector is responsible for building about half of the housing 
stuck in the global south. And these ideas of sustainability and resilience very rarely are paying attention to that sector. So the argument of the book is we need perhaps new narratives. We need to reinterpret those narratives. We need to listen much more to communities and people on the ground because our official and academic narratives are certainly not resonating and they're certainly not causing the type of effects we want. We, want, we need, for example, a strong institution, something that neoliberal policy is trying to avoid. We need a strong institution that can take care of people and react after disasters. I show in the book the example of uh, the Federation of Coffee Growers in Colombia after the earthquake of 1999, a strong institution in the Colombian political system and administrative system that was very useful to produce the type of change that was required. This organization was able to rebuild about 14,000 individual projects in a period of two years. But that requires expertise and that requires appropriate knowledge of the situation. And in that case, the Coffee Growers Federation decided to give money directly to people to try to see how people reacted to that and how they would use their resources. And it eventually became a very successful reconstruction experience. Another case I show, these are just examples, is the city of Facatativa, in Colombia, like many other cities in the global south, Facatativa is crossed by a river that overflows in the rainy season very often, about once a year, and destroys houses and peoples and lives. And this experience tells us that sometimes we need more freedom for the low income and excluded and marginalized communities, and maybe restrictions for the most privileged. And let me give you an example of how these freedoms were expanded for low-income families in Facatativa. The mayor at that time didn't have enough resources to build the 2,000 houses that were required to reduce risk in his town. But he realized that he had money to build half houses. And that's exactly what he did. He basically built court houses. You can see here in black lines, the core unit that was uh, given to people with the expectation of the idea that people will finish their houses with, with more money and resources later on. And that's exactly what happened. People accepted the challenge and worked by themselves in completing their units. And the core housing project was properly designed in a way that at the back, people could complete and finish their houses. That's exactly what happened a few months later. People were already finishing their homes. And because of the density and proximity to services, the neighborhood eventually improved the quality of life of people, but also their income opportunities. People have started building, opening businesses at home and integrating income generating activities within homes. So what is this, all of this telling us? Well, disasters are often seen as ideal opportunities to modernize and plan from scratch. This idea of the blank slate will start from scratch, we will replace what is existing and problematic with new solutions. But we need to wonder who wins and who loses from this radical change. We increasingly have to challenge this idea because many, quite often, it is the marginalized, excluded, and the poor who lose in that game. We have placed an exaggerated hope in technology, the private sector, and markets, both for reducing risk and reconstruction and reconstructing after disasters, and sometimes in detriment of consolidating strong institutions. That's an, a, a common argument throughout the book. Now, liberalism, for example, builds, builds on strong alliances between political and economic elites. This, they, they are usually behind this idea of sustainable development and resilience. And, and, and neoliberal policy very often uses also sustainability and resilience as arguments to legitimize that type of change. Risk reduction is not only about writing policy. Sometimes policies were written in paper, it looks good. But again, it's kind of this plastic straw fallacy or sophism, because the real change changes require implementation. And implementation is very difficult. It's extremely difficult sometimes. It requires trust and emotions and attention to detail and permanence. And it requires understanding and ethics and empathy. It is necessary to expand the rights and freedoms of the most vulnerable. But sometimes we also need to prevent the most privileged from creating or perpetuating new risks. 
Climate change is seen as a problem of social and environmental injustices. It is necessary to redress them, including multiple, multiple stakeholders, and also perhaps including the informal sector, one of the largest industries today in the world. It is key to understand local narratives. I think we need to hear more, and this book is about listening to people and hearing what they're saying on the ground and comparing that with our abstract and hollow jargon of sustainability, resilience, adaptation, innovation, participation, and many other um, slogans. We need to think about risk beyond fear. We cannot write policy based on the idea that people will be afraid of disasters, will be afraid of the earthquake, will be afraid of tornadoes or hurricanes. Yes, there is the issue of fear, but there are many more emotions happening on the ground and linked to risk and disasters and change. Dancing, soccer, cultural activities are, for example, climate actions too. And I show in the book examples of how these social and cultural activities have an impact on the way we think about risk. They're key to produce change. So we cannot write policy only based on the idea that people will be afraid of hazards. That's only part of the story. But people also have attachment to place. People have aspirations. They also want opportunities. They also want the state to be present. There are many other emotions and feelings and, and aspects that we need to understand beyond the idea of fear. More humility certainly is needed. We need to listen more. We need to pay more attention to what people are saying. We need to avoid our abstract and hollow jar jargon and, and concepts and listen much more and accept that we don't have the solutions, and we sometimes don't have the knowledge to provide the right type of solutions. It certainly won't be any easy, but it requires sacrifices. And the question I ask in this book, are we ready to make real sacrifices or do we still want to rely on the plastic straw fallacies that are not producing the type of change we need? And this is what the book is about and I look forward to the discussion. So thank you very much for this invitation. Thank you so much, uh, yes, Professor uh, Giraldo, um, for such a thought-provoking provo presentation. Um, we are ahead of time, and although we have a dedicated Q&A uh, segment at, uh, um, at the end, I think we can, uh, um, we can take a few questions from, from the floor. We have about 10 minutes. Sure, um, it would be a pleasure. So, uh, okay. Um, so uh, if, you, if you have a comment, uh, reaction, question, uh, suggestion, please uh, use the raise hand uh, uh, feature. And uh, okay. So we have a comment. Um, okay. How does climate change impact nature? <laughs> That's something very interesting. We tend to think about the impact of climate change in human systems. We tend to think about its impact on people. But talking to local leaders in Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, we have found that for many local residents, climate change is a problem that affects their ecosystems. And they tend to think about the effects on, for example, natural forests. They tend to think of the impacts on fauna and flora. So yes, it is very important. I think it's a very good question, uh, Ali Mubarak, to think about how climate change is also affecting ecosystems and how important those ecosystems are for people, not only in terms of livelihoods, but also in terms of meaning and, and, and significance for them. So what is needed to boost nature's resilience to climate change? To boost nature's resilience to climate change? Oh, that's a tricky one. Um, I, I don't know. First of all, do we want to boost nature's resilience? Well, uh, I, I don't know. I, I will pass on that one because it's, it's a tricky one, but uh, interesting. You make me think about that. Interesting. There mm -hmm. is another one. Based on your experience, what type of challenges do you, do you see? Well, one of the challenges I see is, is the issue of narratives and language, the type of language we're using. Sometimes it's not helping us very much. We are remaining at a very superficial level without tackling the real roots, the, the, the roots of, of, of vulnerabilities and the, and the structural causes 
of risk. So uh, the next, what's the most important takeaway you want people to remember after reading this book? It isn't easy, but we have to make real sacrifices. I think that's the main conclusion. It won't be any easy. If we really want to tackle these things, it requires changes and sacrifices. It requires implementation. It requires much more than writing good policy. Okay, there is uh, another comment. Um, I would love to hear Professor Literaldo's thoughts on how the informal sector could be better included in disaster preparedness resilience initiatives. Yeah, one of the examples I showed, the last example is, is very interesting because at that time, the mayor decided to build these core houses I showed you, but also give chance to the people to expand them. And, and many of the people, most of the residents actually expanded their homes and finished their homes by relying precisely on the informal sector. So it was an interesting way of incorporating different types of stakeholders, government stakeholders, funding agencies, but also residents and the informal sector. It's, it's a good example. Uh, there are many others in the book, but that's perhaps a, an example that comes to my mind at this moment. Okay, the next one. In the US, I'm seeing resilience being adapted by everyone, but, but the marginalized. How do we make an impact there? Sure. Um, I, I, work, I worked recently a lot in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, and, and very rarely people almost never people on the ground use the term resilience spontaneously. They would use it if we as academics or, or, or government officials come with that concept, but it doesn't come out naturally from people. Um, they all, they have different narratives. They're thinking about social injustices and environmental injustices, and they're thinking about aspirations and social status and other things. So uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure what it means that people are, Resilience is being adapted. Um, I think that we perhaps need different narratives when it comes to dealing with the risk and needs and expectations of the marginalized and excluded. And we have to keep looking for different explanations and concepts and local frameworks and meanings and ideas that have value within communities rather than this idea of adaptation and resilience. Okay, the next one, in the absence of a strong state, how does a strong institution develop? Thinking of cases in the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo, where NGO, uh, NGOs have replaced institutions and then hinder development. Yes, the liberal policy often tells us that strong institutions, we should be afraid of strong institutions. Strong institutions become autocratic, strong institutions reduce the rights and freedoms of, of people and so on. And it is true that there have been abuses by strong institutions. There are still many abuses every day by strong institutions. But I show in the book examples of strong institutions that worked with the private sector, that also worked with people, and that, real, that, that had confidence on the capacity of people to manage funds, for example, rather than centralizing decision-making these strong institutions also partnered with other institutions. And I show examples in India, I show examples in South Africa, I show examples in Colombia, where these strong institutions do not become autocratic. They instead partner with other stakeholders to produce the type of solutions that we need. Uh, there are very good examples. For example, after the uh, earthquake in Gujarat in, in India of, of, of the uh, state government, developing this owner dream and reconstruction, giving money to people to so they could make choices according to their to their own problems, according to their needs and expectations and resources and so on. And this owner driven reconstruction process was also adapted in Colombia after the 1999 earthquake, as opposed to this neoliberal policy, for example, that has been applied in Central America for several decades and that has increased vulnerabilities rather than reduce risks. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, nothing else in the chat. Uh, any other uh, intervention? Few more minutes? Okay. 
I think we probably, as I say, you will have an opportunity at the end. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Professor Lizaralde. Uh, that was a, a great presentation. And so maybe now we can move on to our um, next speaker, Ilan Kalman, who is a professor of disasters and health at University College London, England, and a professor too at the University of Adger, Christian and Norway. His overall research interest is linking disasters, disasters and health, including the integration of climate change into disaster research and health research. This research covers three main areas. One, disaster diplomacy and health diplomacy. Two, island sustainability involving safe and healthy communities in isolated locations. And three, risk education for health and disasters. Professor Kelman, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity and to the organizers, but especially thank you to Gonzalo for that brilliant presentation, which really covered everything. So I have nothing to say, I'll see you at the reception. Although, have you ever known an academic not to want to talk when they're given the floor? So I might as well then bounce off what Gonzalo has said, an absolutely brilliant, brilliant uh, overview of some of the issues to perhaps take them and drive more deeply into what we can do about it, what we might want to do about it, what we should do about it. Also recognizing that the discussion cannot and should not stop here. We need to exchange, we need to learn from each other. We need to point out, you know what, this just isn't quite working, we can do it this way. And even if we diverge in ideas, still come together for the common goal. So I've put in the chat my contact details, please do connect, please do continue through social media and publicize all of these ideas and approaches to ensure that we do better. Because we are the privileged ones. The pandemic has not been easy for anyone. We should never underestimate how much it has affected us, how much it does affect us. But nonetheless, we can continue our work to try to say, you know what, we could have stopped this. We did not need to have this situation. We knew everything that we had to know in order to stop it. And yet so much went wrong, devastating those who had the least to lose and the most to gain. What we should have done is recognize the knowledge we have, the abilities we have, the capabilities we have, and made choices to avoid the disaster, to prevent the disaster, to mitigate the impacts, and to ensure that those who are the worst affected were actually helped the most when in, in actual fact it was the opposite. So what do we mean by choices? And in a sense, that's where the title uh, of my talk comes from in terms of disaster by choice. We know that disasters come from human decisions and human impacts and human approaches, fundamentally human values. It doesn't come from the earthquake or the flood because plenty of places have big earthquakes and don't have a disaster. Plenty of places have big floods and don't have a disaster. That means that somehow, somewhere, we are creating a system or conditions by which a perfectly typical event from the environment ends up collapsing buildings when we could build them to stand up, ends up hurting people, making them even more poor than they already are, when we could actually bring in systems which give them opportunities to have more fulfilling livelihoods and which let a new virus run rampant around the world because we've decided over the long term not to implement and enforce and obey the monitoring and surveillance systems which exist. And then of course our local and national health systems are not fully geared towards dealing with something which has happened before and which we all knew was coming. So disaster by choice is actually choice by those who can choose. Those with the power, the opportunities and the resources to say, you know what? We need a building code because we're in a major seismic zone. Or we know that a virus is there. So rather than silencing the doctors and public health authorities who alerted, rather than pretending nothing is happening, we're actually going to learn the lessons from past mistakes, like the previous coronavirus pandemic, 
SARS 2002-2004 and ensure this doesn't happen again. Instead, we see time and time again that those who have the power opportunities and resources make the decisions that others experience the worst impacts of disasters and that others continue to be susceptible to possible disasters. Exactly as per the quotation that Gonzalo gave us, people harm, not environmental harm, not nature's harm, but people harm, people, society, making choices for others so that they experience the disaster, which is exactly why we need this title, Unnatural Disasters. These disasters are not natural. So we prefer to avoid that phrase, just call them disasters, recognize natural disaster is a misnomer, to really underlie our, it's our whole way of thinking that needs to shift. If we call them natural disasters, yeah, you know what? It was an act of deity. Sorry, Zeus, please help me a bit more. Well, we'll, we'll sort of say that, yeah, maybe it was nature. There was nothing we could do. It was random. As opposed to saying, you know what? It's a disaster and we could have done something about it. Recognizing that the choices that people are making happen over the long term. Those powerful and absolutely terrifying stories from Gonzalo on Port-au-Prince and the rest of Haiti, they did not build that overnight. They were not forced to live in poverty and marginalization without the power opportunities resources overnight. It takes generations to build a city guaranteed to collapse in the next earthquake. It takes decades, if not centuries, to build a city which ends up sinking below sea level in a hurricane zone with a river and a lake above much of the city. I'm talking about New Orleans. This takes time. It's a long-term process. So even though the earthquake happens in 30 seconds or 90 seconds, even though the flash flood might have 24 hours or 24 minutes of warning, that's just the environmental side. That's just nature doing what nature does. The actual disaster, the people who are in the conditions, the circumstances which lead them to being hit, that takes a long time. So changing our frame of mind, not, it means also thinking beyond natural disaster and beyond other trite phrases like disaster event. Because disaster is a process. Earthquakes are events. Tornadoes, avalanches, volcanic eruptions. We can to a large degree delineate where they start and, and end in space and time. But the disaster is ever present. The disaster is all around us. The disaster started with colonialization, continued with post-colonialization. The disaster started by people saying, ooh, I can acquire wealth. And you know what? I'm going to continue that with my children and grandchildren. So it's a disaster process, not a disaster event which means recognizing that, again, we have to flip our frame of mind to think what choices do we have the power to make in order to tackle the disaster process, tackle the disaster problem. You know, it's that time of year when we're thinking of the holidays and in the Northern hemisphere, that white fluffy stuff might come down from the sky and we have all the insurance companies and reinsurance companies publishing reports on the top 10 disasters of the year. Dramatic headlines, costs, economics, insurance. Whereas why is no one publishing a report about the top 10 disasters avoided in the year where there was a massive hazard, but no disaster because people dealt with the process over the long term. And Gonzalo alludes a bit to this in his book, but I've been asking insurance companies and others for a long time. I've been trying to do it myself, but it's a question of getting uh, enough people to support in order to say, yes, things are not good. The disaster potential is huge, but let's look at the good practice case studies. Let's look at what we, where we can succeed and what we can do. Or similarly, get all the UN heads together as an emergency flash appeal between Geneva and New York and Nairobi and say, we need to fundraise because these people haven't had a disaster, but they're really, really susceptible to one. Like an earthquake in Kingston, Jamaica. 
which could have been easily the same time as a 2010 or 2021 earthquake in Haiti, as devastating, but Kingston, Jamaica has not been hit for quite some time. So perhaps we need an emergency flash appeal to support people in averting an earthquake disaster in Jamaica. Otherwise, the whole approach to the phrasing we use, the whole approach to the histrionics of disasters which we use are really trying to divert the attention from ourselves. As per one of Gonzalo's slides, is it an atmospheric crisis or is it a human crisis? Yet everywhere we hear these phrases, climate crisis, climate emergency. Well, first of all, climate is a statistical property by definition. The issue is actually human caused climate change. It's not climate per se. And second, it's a very insidious way of misdirecting our attention by saying, you know, it's a climate. It's that big global ephemeral issue of climate, which is a crisis or emergency, rather than, you know what, it's a human values crisis. It's us doing it. Give the planet a million years and it won't notice we were here. The issue is we are being harmed and active choices are being made to harm those who are the most susceptible to harm beyond their control. So we should really free frame this to say it's about us. It's a people crisis, a community crisis, a human crisis, rather than trying to blame this bizarre st st statistical construct of climate. Planetary boundaries, another populist phrase, but it's not about the planet, it's us, it's human boundaries. Now, that's not what the inventors meant but it's what they did. Even though we had the knowledge to know that in the 50 years of contemporary disaster research, we've tried to move away from blaming nature and the environment, away from the phrase natural disaster to focus on ourselves. And now climate crisis, climate emergency, planetary boundaries is simply bringing us back to that technocratic nature-based paradigm. It gets worse. People are talking about climate chaos. Well, yeah. The climate is a chaotic system mathematically. Climate chaos is a truism. So how can we reinforce what we know are unnatural disasters, our disaster by choice, rather than reverting back to what people in the 70s and early 80s tried to overcome by tackling the nature-centric environmental blame and environmental determinism approach? Ultimately, it's this academic phrase, social construction disaster. Yeah, just disaster by choice, unnatural disasters. That we are going back to the social deconstruction of disaster by not accepting the blame for those who deserve it, by not recognizing how we could move forward constructively with those who have the choices, who have the opportunities. So it really comes down to focusing on what we know. And then realize actually not a lot, which is new. So we come out with these really fascinating and very difficult to understand phrases, which aren't hardly translatable across many languages like climate change adaptation. I've yet to find an action in climate change adaptation, which has not before been suggested to deal with disasters. In fact, dealing with disasters covers everything that climate change adaptation gives and even more. So we could actually just say, if we deal with disasters, by definition, we're dealing with climate change impacts and just have you know one phrase that we have to think about, disasters, rather than three words, climate change adaptation and a lot more. It's the same issue with people talking now about climate adaptation. Well, yeah. If you take an umbrella when you go outside, well, that's actually weather adaptation or weather adjustment. And what's the difference between adjustment and adaptation? It's remarkable how frequently people conflate weather, climate, natural climate change, and human-caused climate change, as opposed to really just saying what we mean instead of trying to blame everything on the devastation that we're wreaking upon the planet one symptom of which, not cause per se, but one symptom of which is a rapid and substantive change in the climate. So suddenly every single hurricane that happens is a fault of human caused climate change. Well, okay, but you know, hurricanes have happened for a while. 
And if you're in the hurricane belt during hurricane season, you might expect hurricanes. Even Hurricane Ida, people were saying, this is climate change. A hurricane went over land from New Orleans to New York, over land. So it took me 10 minutes to find four hurricanes from the previous century that had gone over land from New Orleans to New York. Particularly ironic, because every single climate change projection since a key, pa since key papers in 2009 and 2010 have said that hurricane frequency is decreasing because of cli human caused climate change. Fewer hurricanes. Intensity is increasing. They're going to be worse. They're probably going to form closer to the east coast of the US, so there's less warning time. And they tend to be moving slower in their tracks, so they have a lot more rain and dump it in the same place which we saw the signal in 2017 in Hurricane Harvey. But human-caused climate change is bad enough without making up science or exaggerating by trying to claim that there's going to be more storms when the projection is least storms. And in any case, a hurricane is just a hazard, right? It's just the environment. The disaster comes from our inability to say, yeah, okay, we're in the hurricane zone in hurricane season, there's going to be a storm. Or more to the point, people don't have the choices, don't have the power, opportunity, and resources to say, well, a storm's coming in, you know, I'm on my iPhone 45 or whatever it is, and on 7G or whatever the latest is, so I better get out and I'll go to a nice hotel for three days. Because most people don't have that access. Most people cannot go to jump in their car and go to a hotel for three days. In fact, people make very rational decisions to stay below sea level as a storm is coming in because they fear assault or robbery or harassment while evacuating or in the shelter or they have no means of transport for getting there. We cannot blame them. We have to tackle the choices which create a societal structure by which assault and robbery and harassment are everyday conditions, everyday disastrous conditions forcing people into certain choices that they end up drowning in a hurricane for which everyone had decades of warning it would happen, plenty of prior experience, and days of warning that a particular storm was coming in. We are very good at avoiding admission of the real causes of disasters, the disaster process, the long-term nature, the role of time. And there, in fact, is a, a key disaster researcher by name of Et Etkin, Dave Etkin, yes, David Etkin, who in 1999 published a brilliant paper on risk transference to the future. He used in particular the idea of dikes and levees, basically structural approaches to trying to stop floods, pointing out, compiled with plenty of theoretical and uh, empirical evidence from around the world, that what happens is you build a wall, you keep the small floods out. People say, oh, it's safe. And look, there's a wall there. So that's fine. I can build here without flood resistance measures. Inevitably, there's a flood which exceeds that wall's design capacity. And people are shocked, stunned that they're flooded. And so the flood disaster is far, far worse than it would have been without that structural approach. So his idea is risk transference into the future. We get rid of the small floods and the small disasters in order to uh, support future risk. It's a time issue. Same as Tony Oliver Smith talked about the 400 year earthquake or 500 year earthquake, not the geological return period, not doing seismological calculations saying, if we assume uniformitarianism, let's take this fault as being constant, which of course it never is. And therefore we calculate and say, this is the earthquake we expect every 400 years. He said, no, when we get an earthquake or a disaster involving an earthquake, like the one Gonzalo mentioned regarding Haiti, that actually took 400 years or 500 years for the conditions to build up by which the catastrophe was inevitable. If it weren't the earthquake, maybe a hurricane. And Haiti has plenty of hurricane disasters, both before and after 2010. If it weren't the earthquake or hurricane, maybe landslides, maybe other environmental aspects, or simply the day-to-day -day disaster of having to live in an exploited, 
post-colonial marginalized situation by which all the powers with the resources force you to avoid helping yourself to do better. This is the disaster. This is the long-term nature of the challenges we face. So remember history. But when we do so, we find that it's not all bad news. We're all here at York University, well, at least to some degree. So think of Toronto, 1954, way back in ancient history. Hurricane Hazel slashed through the city, killing over 80 people, ripping houses from their foundations alongside rivers. Alongside rivers. Okay, they were in a floodplain. So a hurricane comes along, dumps a lot of rain, and the floodplain gets flooded. What did Toronto do? Well, rather than rebuilding in the floodplain, rather than recreating the conditions which led to the disaster, rather than returning to the normal, whereby people were guaranteed to die in the next hurricane, in conjunction with wider changes in municipal governance, they said, you know what? A floodplain can be a floodplain. And now Toronto markets itself as a city within a park because you have absolutely gorgeous ravine systems along the Humber River and the Don River and the tributaries, which are walking paths, recreational paths. You know, you see deer there, you see muskrats, incredible for flowers and bird watching. But they were actually there to a large degree to avoid another disaster. So people think of it as being environmental education. Think people think of it as being green commuting routes, but they're there to make a floodplain, a floodplain. Rivers do not burst their banks. They reclaim their territory. And so when Hurricane Isabel hit Toronto in 2003, when Hurricane Sandy hit Toronto in 2012, those rivers became raging torrents like during Hurricane Hazel in 54. They simply reclaimed their territory. The walking paths were damaged. The bridges were damaged. There was a lot of mud and trees to clean up, but there was no big flood disaster because we had taken a long-term process in order to avoid what happened in Hurricane Hazel. One person was killed in Toronto in Hurricane Sandy. A sign was blown loose in the wind and hit them. This shows what can be achieved. And it's not just, you know, our own places. Bangladesh, 1970, perhaps up to half a million people killed in a cyclone. It was East Pakistan at the time. Think about that, up to half a million. We can't even count the bodies. We don't know how many people died. 1985, tens of thousands killed in another cyclone. 1991, over 140,000 killed in a cyclone. Then we can look at 2020, 2021. A few cyclones went through. Dozens killed in each, from hundreds of thousands to dozens. OK, it took two generations, but you put in awareness, you put in a warning system, you put in education, you put in evacuation, you put in sheltering. But more to the point, you put in livelihoods, which people know they can return to after they evacuate. And you put in livelihoods, which people can adjust while they're cleaning up the damage from a cyclone. So Bangladesh is as a success story regarding tropical cyclones, hurricanes and cyclones, as Toronto. Now, this does not preclude those places having other disasters. Imagine if there's a summer without rain in Toronto, the ravine system will be tinder dry, and there's a lightning strike or a discarded cigarette. Would there be a huge conflagration across that ravine? Bangladesh is the, you know, the big poster for climate change is going to destroy this country. But I, I think we can be optimistic, maybe it's not the good word, we can be confident that Dhaka is going to be flattened by an earthquake, likely long before sea level rise causes major problems because Bangladesh is not ready for the major earthquake which they're expecting. So our lesson is to balance the good with the bad draw on the success stories to show that people, cities can make choices regarding the disaster process to prove that disasters are not natural. We should not be succumbing to the dominant ideals of climate does this, climate change does this, it's the earthquakes problem. We should not be using 
these phrases which remove the responsibility from ourselves, particularly when they collapse at the first investigation. So it's to echo what Gonzalo said, focus on the roots, focus on the fundaments. These are not natural, they are up to us. By admitting this, by being honest about what different environmental processes do and do not do, and different what human, what human processes do and do not do, then we can hopefully and really aim for changing disaster by choice into no disaster by choice. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an insightful presentation, Professor Kerman. Um, we do have a few minutes, uh, about eight, and I do see that there are quite a few comments. Um, they're not questions, at least I haven't seen the last two. Um, I, I mean, I, I'm wondering if, uh, um, if uh, we want to